Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. This week, I'm taking a look at a movie. And in keeping with my recent theme of relatively recent film and television releases, and video game and so forth and so on, I'm taking a look at a recent movie release. That movie being Mission Impossible 4 Ghost Protocol. Because this movie is still in theaters, I can't intersplice intersplice clips of the movie with my whole spiel. So this is going to be a talking head review. Sorry. Now, quick disclaimer before I get too far into this. I have not seen Mission Impossible 3, but I have seen Mission Impossible 1 and 2, and I've read a synopsis of 3, so I have a general gist of what's come before. This film starts off with Ethan Hunt in a Russian prison, and he gets, broke, he gets busted out by his Mission Imp- IMF team to basically give him his new mission. Um, the mission being he and his team must sneak into the Kremlin and get documentation on the identity of a mysterious terrorist by the name of Cobalt, or nickname of Co- Cobalt. By the time they get there, however, the records have already been stolen by Cobalt, and Ethan realizes after the fact that he's, in fact, passed Cobalt in the hall on the way there. Before the team could chase after Cobalt and get the records pe- back, however, Cobalt puts his plan into effect and blows up a chunk of the Kremlin, framing the IMF. Hunt is captured, um, but does manage to escape. His team, and in fact the entire IMF, is disavowed by the president, and he institutes ghost protocol basically requiring every member of the IMF to um, turn themselves in, they'll all be arrested, and so forth and so on, so the government doesn't get in trouble with, you know, the Russians leading into a nasty war. But when Ethan describes Cobalt to to the secretary and the analyst who was with him, played by Jeremy Renner, named William Brandt, um... They, in fact, discover that nuclear war is Cobalt's goal. Cobalt is, in fact, a fit, a nuclear strategist who realizes that it is best in his eyes for the future of humanity if there is, in fact, a nuclear war under controlled circumstances, which I presume means without a nasty conventional war first. So, the secretary attaches Brant to Ethan's team, and basically sends them on an off-the-books mission to find Cobalt and prevent him from starting a global thermonuclear war that could cause the end of the world as we know it. And that ultimately leads to my problem with the film, which I'll get to first. Let's accentuate the positive and talk about the good here. This is a solid cast. Tom Cruise is not a terrible actor, and he does a really good job as Ethan Hunt. I appreciate the work he puts into the role. Um, for Ethan's team, he played by um, Paula Patton as Jane Hunter, and Simon Pegg as Benji Dunn from the third movie, which I haven't seen. They all do decent jobs. In the case of Simon Pegg and um, Paula Patton, excellent jobs. Jeremy Renner does a pretty good job, a good job, as William Brandt, and it gives me some hopes for how well he'll turn out as Hawkeye in the upcoming Avengers movie. The roles are just solid. The problem I have with this is, well, the villain's plot. Cobalt, um, real name Kurt Hendricks, who's played by... Uh, Michael Nyquist, who you may remember from the Swedish version of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Well, in short, his goal is to end the world, as I mentioned earlier. And that doesn't quite fit with the standard Mission Impossible bad guy. In the television series, the IMF's job, basically, was to do relatively... I don't want to say it's mundane spy stuff, but it's overthrow a dictator or um, steal nuclear weapons from a from not Castro, or to steal Nazi gold or thwart a, a mob slash syndicate plot or that sort of thing. It's relatively 
minor low-key stuff. In fact, in Mission Impossible is the anti-James Bond. Not quite as much as, well, the John le Carré, George Smiley stuff like Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, but it is very much anti-James Bond where it is... Where Bond operates alone, the IMF operates in teams. Where Bond, well, kills a lot of people while going through his missions, the IMF keeps a low body count. While Bond is saving the world, IMF is relatively mundane and stuff that very easily could be completely under the public's radar. This is quite the opposite. In fact, I find it somewhat amusing that... The last two Bond films have had relatively mundane, reasonable, realistic sort of plots. In the sense that Casino Royale is about a bank banker to the terrorists who loses a bunch of money, he loses his clients' money due to various poor decisions and stuff that's Bond thwarted, and Bond ends up basically ripping him off at the poker table. It's not totally super realistic, but it makes sense and it fits. Um, it's nothing that would be as above the radar as on the news as, say, for example, the heat ray from Die Another Day. In Quantum of Solace, the plot in that film is basically all about water and control of water leading to control of a country. It's a little less realistic, but it's more realistic than this. Um, it's straight up, I mean, if you've seen the documentary I think it's Water Wars on Netflix Instant, I believe it's done as part of the Public Broadcasting Independent Lens series. It talks about how perhaps the next big future conflict over natural resource in the world might not be open to over oil, but over water. And it's well done. And you can kind of tell that the writers of Quantum of Solace saw this and said, hey, this gives me an idea for a Bond movie. This would be a plot of our next Bond movie, since it's meant to be more grounded and more gritty. On the other hand, Mission Impossible 4, it just straight up saved the world plot. And the first save the world plot in this history of the franchise. Television series, they never went there. I went and read synopses of basically every episode of the television series. They never went into the Save the World territory. As far as the films go, Mission Impossible 1 was about a list of identities of secret agents. It's basically sort of a Kim Philby kind of thing. Are we done skipping frames? Okay. Mission Impossible 2, yes, it's about a super virus, but it's a super virus where the bad guys aren't planning to end all life on Earth. They just want to release the virus and then sell the antidote and make a bunch of money. That's it. It's money, dear boy. Mission Impossible 3. The synopsis I've read, there is a, but there's speculation that the quote, rabbit's foot, the MacGuffin of the film, is the end of the world weapon or something like that, but really, honestly, from what I've read, the rabbit's foot, while it's McGuffin and everyone's chasing after it, what the film is really about is hunting for the mole in the IMF and trying to get Ethan Hunt's wife back. It's not about saving the world. And so this is the first film where it is clearly, we have to save the world. We have to stop global thermonuclear Armageddon. And it doesn't fit. I mean, the action sequences are great. The locations they go to are awesome. In particular, they have a massive set piece set inside the biggest hotel in the world, or the biggest building in the world, in Dubai, which is a hotel. And it's very well done. But there comes this point where we go, where I go, really? We're going to save the world in a series that is known for not going to save the world? I'm disappointed. Now, that said, is this a terrible movie? No. Again, the acting performances are good. The 
action sequences are well done. They don't do too much of the face masky stuff from earlier films. Uh, in particular, Mission Impossible 2 got a bit over... Not a bit, got extraordinarily over the top with this. Also, as far as action sequences go in terms of body count, we do get something of a return to the original Mission Impossible series, where the IMF, as a general rule, is not pulling a gun unless, well, it's in self-defense. And even then, body count is kept to a minimum, as opposed to Mission Impossible 2, where Bond is just... Not Bond. Mission Impossible 2, where Ethan Hunt is just ripping through loads of bad guys. Because John Woo film, and you can't have a John Woo film without jumping sideways while firing two guns. Which is something that even Bond hasn't done. Uh, we have um, Mission Impossible 3, which I believe has, from the synopsis I've read, has Ethan's team doing a sort of insertion special uh, under the cover that they're being a special ops team to retrieve something or extract someone. I forget the precise details because I haven't seen it. That doesn't help. But on the other hand, Mission Impossible 3, I can count the number of people that Ethan's team kills on the fingers of one hand. They even managed to capture some of the villain's goons alive. Which is rather impressive. Considering that this is... that Well, in movies, they like neatly wrapped up loose ends. They like being able to... Okay, the bad guy is dead. He's gotten his karmic retribution. As opposed to the bad guy is taken out in handcuffs and is going to receive a trial at some point in the future. Is going to be held at Gitmo or someplace in the future. I mean, this is a problem that earlier Batman films had, where they like the nice, tidy, loose ends and would rather kill off the Joker, Two-Face, and so forth, than have them sing around in Arkham, possibly able to bring back later, but possibly not. So, would I recommend seeing this film in theaters? Yes. This is a very, this is a very well done film. Also, the thing would will definitely say in this film's favor, um, Brad Bird. This is his first live action film he's directed. He's done many animated films before, both with Pixar, like The Incredibles, and I believe uh, Ratatouille. And I believe he did all three Toy Story films. At least, he did at least the first one. I don't know. Don't recall about two and three. Um, and the film The Iron Giant. So he has a good sense of direction and how to make an action sequence and to frame shots and that sort of thing from animation. But I was kind of interested coming into this, how to translate this into live action. Because live action, honestly, you have a degree of resource limitation that you don't have in animation. In terms of, you can design your sets however way you want and not have to worry about the cost of actually building the set. You can have basically the world's biggest set ever, bigger than any soundstage that could ever exist on Earth in animation. And my concern was that Bird's reach would go beyond his grasp, and he would possibly end himself the film suffering because of this. But it doesn't. This film is honestly a, fan a fantastic film with just the one problem of the plot and it not fitting in with admittedly my vision of what Mission Impossible is as opposed to Bond as opposed to well the rest of the spy action movie genre or even just the spy film genre I would recommend checking it out while it's still in theaters I did not see this in IMAX I've heard the film was shot with IMAX in mind and thus, the IMAX version of the film will probably be better, but it will cost you a little more, more than I could afford to go see. So if you have a proper IMAX theater near you, definitely check it out in that venue. But, other than, other than that, it's a good movie. Give it a watch. As far as my next review goes, well, 
next week I'm going to be taking a look at another current game. And in fact, I'm going to be finishing off my Gears of War series of reviews with taking a look at Gears of War 3. Because the game is current and recent and all that sort of fun stuff, I'm going to try and keep it spoiler free. But that's okay. However, if you're expecting the sort of same in-depth blow-by-blow recap from the first two games, you'll probably be a little disappointed. So until next time, I'm Count Zero. I want to thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.